What is your message to Western human rights groups, to President Obama, respect, to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender re people? Respect African societies and their values. The actions of homosexuality can never be acceptable. They are evil. Therefore, if this association is so as to spread, popularize, and bring about more and more people into this kind of actions and behavior, then we call it out as evil and must be addressed as They say that our society will point us if we'll be sitting with you. I'm not a criminal. I'm a human being. Yeah, she says, so you can't be trans if you're under 18. Absolutely, you should be treated as mm. the gender you were born. Mm. And she will anger a lot of the lobby. And, and I think this is half of the problem is that you lose that ability to debate it. In Trinidad and Tobago, LGBT activists are celebrating a landmark ruling, calling a colonial law outlawing buggery unconstitutional. Section 377 was a relic of the British colonial rule. The court's ruling has affirmed that laws that treat people as second-class citizens based on their sexual orientation have no place in modern India. If that suggestion is accepted and the law is changed, isn't there a danger that it may have repercussions on children, that these men may also go after children? Well, from the evidence we've had, <clears throat> oddly enough, the opposite is what we should expect. And children who need to be able to count and multiply are learning anti-racist mathematics, whatever that may be. Children who need to be able to express themselves in clear English are being taught political slogans. Children who need to be taught to respect traditional moral values are being taught that they have an inalienable right to be gay. It's a little known fact that prior to the arrival of the British colonial regime, many indigenous tribes in Africa and Asia were accepting people of same-sex intimacy and gender variants. For example, the Igbo and Yoruba tribes in Nigeria, as well as the Dagaba people of Ghana, assign gender later in life, not at birth. Meanwhile, the Imbangala people of Angola recognize men and women's clothing as a cultural norm. However, the introduction of anti-gay legislation by British colonizers in India in 1861 marked a significant turning point for the LGBTQ plus community. These laws, which were imposed in colonized territories in an attempt to set standards of behavior, led to widespread discrimination and persecution, as well as marginalization and stigmatization. They not only undermined personal privacy and freedom, but also created an atmosphere of fear and mistrust. Sadly, out of the 69 countries where homosexuality is criminalized today, 36 of them are former British colonies. Many Commonwealth African nations, for instance, still hold on to the colonial era legislation and attitudes towards the LGBTQ plus community. Good evening to all the countries upon which the sun once never set, and you're welcome. That's right, without old Blighty over here, the half the world that Britain set on fire, unalived everyone, and stole everything from, would still be happily accepting gay and trans people. Well, they wouldn't be calling them that, and it's actually complicated in case by case, but we don't have room for nuance here. This is the Daily Telegraph, the only newspaper in Britain that was delivered in person to the Raj giving direct orders on how to suppress the Hijra in South Asia until they went from a sacred class to an underclass, just like we wanted. Lord Nonspotum himself did that, Probably. I don't actually know how old he is, but I'm sure if he had a mouth that could do anything more than scream, he'd be more than happy to talk about it. The point is, however diverse pre-colonial Africa, Asia, Polynesia and the Americas were, we have records of what we today describe as queer people all over the bloody places. The world was positively infested with the gays before the British turned up. And you know us Brits, we couldn't have that. We may have pretended to be progressive for a few years when we legalised gay marriage, but this is Turth Island, goddammit! And by God, did the British Empire let the world know that we wouldn't stand for any relationship that wasn't completely miserable, joyless and sexless. Just like God intended. Being sexually attracted to your partner is honestly... cringe. And being happy in your own body... <laughs> Who do you think we are? The French? Where was I? Oh, 
Oh yes, hello dear viewers and welcome to this YouTube show all about how homophobia and transphobia are some of Britain's most successful exports. I'm Bridget Empire, science and culture correspondent for this here cursed newspaper. Uh, I'm unfortunately a queer living in Britain also. Well, it turns out no matter how badly the British government would love to be running a society free of everyone who doesn't self-immolate within 10 feet of a pride flag, much like most things Britain does, we did way worse overseas. Ever wondered where the queer cultures in Africa went? It's bad. It's, it's really, really bad. And we'll get to it. The thing is, there were always queer people all over the world. The Kill the Gays bill in Uganda, a bill passed a few weeks ago that introduced the death penalty or life in prison for homosexual acts, is not the natural outgrowth of Ugandan culture, despite what conservatives in both Uganda and Britain would probably have you believe. It is a direct result of British colonialism and the global campaign of the eradication of queer cultures along with their mother cultures across the world. The tragic story of Uganda's increasingly hostile clampdowns on their queer communities is the story of a dark victory for British colonialism, even ostensibly after the empire has ended of a mindset forced on Ugandans through mass violence, becoming such an accepted part of the culture that it passed with an overwhelming number of votes in its parliament. In fact, before Uganda as a country was defined, before England as a country was defined, there were gay and trans people in what is now Uganda, living and thriving. And yet, these days there are conservatives in pretty much any country you can find that was and still is a victim of British colonialism, that will claim homophobia and transphobia as a tradition of their people. For example, that being gay is un-African, an opinion that has come up quite a few times due to recent debates in Uganda and Kenya, as well as other sub-Saharan African countries that have discussed this issue, an issue that would have been uncontroversial for parts of most of these countries in the days before the British brought ruin to their shores. This bears no basis in history, however. Queer people are all over the history of Africa, and try as they might, and they did try, the British Empire could not destroy all evidence of their existence. As Bright Alozi writes for Black Perspectives, There is a close relationship between spirituality and sexuality in African cosmology, as well as with the different types of spiritual power associated with each sex. This worldview not only gave rise to male and female gendered spiritual forces, but also allowed for the practice of same-sex relations. Several instances in oral histories, critical texts, folklore, and ethnographic reports confirm that traditional Africa recognised same-sex relations. Thousands of years ago, evidence from rock paintings show the prevalence of anal sex between sand men in present-day Zimbabwe. In Tommy Boy's Lesbian Men, the authors identified several same-sex practices in ancient and contemporary Africa, while in Egypt, as far back as 2400 BCE, excavated bodies of two men, Nian Kumun and Kumunotep, showed them apparently cuddled to each other as lovers. Also, in some traditional African societies, certain magic rituals and rites of passage from boyhood to adulthood often involved same-sex activities. In pre-colonial northern Congo, Azande warrior men routinely married boys who operated as temporary wives. It went to boy wives and female husbands. The practice was institutionalised to the extent that the warriors paid bride price to the parents of the boys. When these boys became warrior men, they too married boy wives. The Portuguese, among the first Europeans to explore the African continent, noted in their ethnographic reports a range of male-to-male -male sexual relations among the Congo people, which they referred to as an unnatural damnation. Writing about the Mbangala people in present-day Angola, Andrew Battelle confirmed that there were men and women's apparel with whom they kept amongst their wives, while Jean-Baptiste Lebas reported about a cast of cross-dressing male diviners known as Chibados, whose leader dresses ordinarily as a woman and makes an honour of being called grandmother. Additionally, Female husbandry demonstrates the fluidity of gender relations and queerness in traditional Africa. For example, Queen Ajinga Mabanda, ruler of the Mabundu people in present-day Angola, who rose to power in 1624 and strongly resisted Portuguese dominion, assumed multiple sexual and gender roles and or identities. She often dressed as a man, married female wives, and had a harem of men whom she had to dress as women. As a female husband, she undoubtedly transgressed gender boundaries and even answered to the title king during battles. In ancient Buganda, present-day Uganda, King Mwanga II, who strongly opposed colonialism and Christianity, was an openly gay monarch. The practice of same-sex relations was rife among the Siwa people of Egypt, Benin people of Nigeria, Nzima people of Ghana, San people of Zimbabwe, and Pangwe people of present-day Gabon and Cameroon. Another noteworthy point is that some pre-colonial African societies did not have a binary of genders. Among the Igbo and Yoruba of Nigeria, 
Gender was not assigned to babies at birth until later in life. Findings on gender relations and pre-colonial Igbo culture demonstrate that gender and sex did not coincide. Gender was flexible and fluid instead, allowing women to become men and vice versa. It was a culture in which gender was reconstructed and performed according to social need. Same-sex relations in Africa are not un-African. While the practice may not have been accepted in all cultures at all times, it certainly predated the European colonial conquest of Africa. If anything, Europeans brought homophobia to Africa. They were intolerant of same-sex relations and established systems of surveillance and regulation for expressing it. So, what happened? Well, in short, Britain happened. To explain why, though, we need to explain why Britain became a force for global homophobic terrorism in the first place. And for that, we need to go way, way back to the halcyon days of ancient Rome. As far as we can tell, it was relatively cool to be gay in pre-Roman Britain, but records are sparse. Generally, the Celtic Britons were enjoying just chilling and not having to write things down, with Romans complaining that we had our tits out and lived in swamps covered in paint or some other nonsense that makes the ancient British sound actually fucking amazing. RE Celtic homosexuality, Diodorus Sicilius, a 1st century BC historian, said, Although Celtic women were beautiful, their men preferred to sleep with each other. Sicilius also noted, that it was an insult if a guest refused an offer of sex from a Celtic man. They usually sleep on the grounds of skins of wild animals and tumble about with a bedfellow of either side, and what is strangest of all is that without any thought for a natural sense of modesty, they carelessly surrender their virginity to other men. Far from finding anything shameful in this, they feel insulted if anyone refuses their favours they offer. And doesn't that just sound like a right-wing comedian bit from today, if we're being honest? And I'm not entirely convinced that it isn't. Like, you know, like... These days, you get arrested and thrown in jail if you refuse to absolutely destroy that Celtic bussy. You know, maybe these islands haven't changed that much in 2000 years, except that the Celtic bussy became a Britussy. A great, great, great Britussy? Great, great bussy? Brit Britannussy? I, I, I don't know. I'll let you all figure out which one is best. Vote on your favourite ancient British bussy name in the comments below to win a free invasion by the Romans, who have heard you had Druidism, which they hate. So yeah, ultimately a lot of pre roman British culture was lost. And from there we start to see the beginnings of homophobia as a British institution. The Romans were pretty homophobic compared to some other ancient European cultures, but as long as you were a top, you were seen as pretty cool no matter who you were bagging. The Romans, you see, weren't so much homophobic as they were violently sexist. And receiving was seen to be effeminate, which of course equals bad. Can you see the seeds of modern Britain peeking through yet? Long story short, being gay is cool, but being a bottom is sus. Also, Hadrian of Warfame was famously gay, and since he was emperor, most people were cool with it, but Elagabalus, who was transgender, didn't get the same treatment. But that's a topic for another video. The important thing is, Constantine the Great begins the conversion of the Roman Empire to Christianity. He's crowned in Britain, so he has a little statue in York where his sword keeps going missing. But anyway, he's, a, he's an important guy, and because he became basically the template for the changing face of the Roman Empire from then on after, the emperors that followed him, apart from Julian the Apostate, who was, you know, an apostate, further cemented the hold that Christianity had in the Roman Empire, and with Christianity came the beginning of homosexual censure in the Roman world, something that would get more solidified as the Western Roman Empire crumbled and Britain entered the medieval period, except for the brief respite where the Anglo-Saxons, Jutes and Frisians brought their own gay shit over to our septed isles, until they converted in the late 6th century, confirming that homosexuality was out. No more gay. Gay bad. Gay bad again. Sorry guys, we messed up. It's out. We, we did a bad, no more gay. Apparently this wasn't enough though, because over the centuries, we have a bunch more events where the king has to go and put his foot down and stop the British being gay. Almost as if it's not something you can just make people stop by telling them no, like it continues to be a thing. For example, in 1002, the Council of London campaigned to convince the English public that homosexuality was a sin. In 1290, the first book suggesting a punishment for homosexuality in English law was published. And in 1533, and this is important, King Henry VIII of wives fame passed the very normally named The Buggery Act, 1533, which made all male and male sex punishable by death. It is this Buggery Act that would be introduced under different guises all over the British Empire, devastating queer expression in countries already ravaged by the horrors of British Imperial Conquest, a direct result of centuries of anti-gay conservative Christian thought originating with the Roman Empire and being carried through by the British Empire a thousand years later. From CNN. The strict Victorian era laws brought in by British colonists often clashed with decades or even centuries of complex local cultural attitudes to sexuality. India, in particular, had traditionally maintained a flexible, non prescriptive view of sexuality and gender roles. But the British administrators paid little attention to local attitudes where they criminalised same sex relations and declared the country's centuries old custom of transgender hijras to be unnatural. 
India was in fact one of the first colonies to outlaw LGBT sexual relations under British imposed legislation. Han, the University of Hong Kong professor, told CNN the Indian laws were then used as a template for other colonies. Indian LGBT activist Trubo Giotti, who helped lead the campaign for the decriminalization of gay sex in India, told CNN that same-sex communities loathe the law, not just because it was wrong, but also because it was alien. This law was not ours. This was not a law that has organically developed in our society, says Giotti. Giotti pointed out that the law didn't only trap members of the LGBT community in the closet, it also invited other forms of discrimination, providing a cover for blackmail and harassment and even sexual assault. The British colonial laws haven't just been used to repress and harass the LGBT community. In many places, they're an active tool to clamp down on political dissent. As was the case in India, Malaysia also criminalizes same-sex relations under Section 377, based on the original British colonial legislation. Under Section 377, prominent Malaysian opposition politician Anwar Ibrahim was imprisoned twice on sodomy charges, which many viewed as spurious and politically motivated. Same-sex relations are outlawed in Uganda under current laws based on the old British penal code. Gay pride events in Uganda are regularly shut down by authorities. A UN special reporter who visited the former British colony of Ghana in April reported widespread discrimination and even violence against LGBT people. Same-sex relations have been illegal in Ghana since the colonial era. The current criminal code uses similar language to the original laws. From the days of the British Empire's first attempts at violent conquest to today, the homophobic culture of Britain, brought over first by the Romans and then solidified by some conservative Christian kings, was forced upon the world at gunpoint. Third gender people like the Hijra of South Asia, the Sister Girls of Australia, the Farafine in Polynesia, and others were violently suppressed, even those that had been considered sacred by pre-colonial societies. The British didn't care. They weren't in the business of respecting other cultures, they were in the business of colonialism. And that meant destroying indigenous ways of life, and violently enforcing the twisted morality of a foggy island in the North Atlantic instead. We can see how this suppressed the Hijra minority in South Asia in this excerpt from the London School of Economics blog by Sophie Hunter. On 6 September last year, the Supreme Court of India struck down Section 377 of the Indian Penal Code, decriminalising homosexuality, Introduced during British colonial rule in India in 1864 as a legal transplant of the British 1533 Buggery Act, this section criminalised non-procreative sexualities. Historically, it was used to target, among others, transgender persons, including hijras. Hijras were traditionally powerful figures in charge of collecting taxes and duties in the Sultanate and Mughal courts. While S377 was not specifically designed to target the hijras, it criminalised them as a group and had serious implications for the community. This legal ruling must still be translated into an effective policy in order to begin to address its lasting repercussions for the Hijra community. The thing is, as if it wasn't enough that the British Empire completely devastated these countries and set up laws modelled on those back home which stamped out indigenous queer communities all over the world, a few hundred years later, we decided back home that we'd become enlightened and in fact being gay was a-okay. And just to have another go at the people we completely steamrolled over, the British decided a new approach was in order condemning these countries for being backwards on queer issues when British colonial laws were the reasons gay people were being discriminated against. Now, don't get me wrong, any anti-queer laws are horrific. Trust me, I'm a transgender lesbian, I'm very aware. But it takes some brass fucking balls to force half the world to turn on its queer communities at gunpoint and then turn around and ask them all why they can't just be a bit nicer to the gays. Like, we know why. And maybe, just maybe, Britain should be taking some responsibility and trying to fix this fucking problem they caused. Instead of getting on its high horse and pretending to sneer at people for not being progressive enough because of beliefs Britain forced upon them. Britain caused this mess. Maybe Britain should be putting money and resources into fixing it. Maybe instead of threatening to pull aid from places we absolutely devastated, we should be offering safe paths for refugees and other immigrants from countries where British colonial rule has made it impossible for them to live authentically at home. Maybe we could try helping people out instead of punishing them. After all, Britain did this. We did this. Global homophobia was a European project, and Europe cannot wash its hands of this and pretend it's enlightened. Frankly, the whole world knows so much better. This is a sad story, and I don't know if it will be resolved in my lifetime. There's a lot of damage left over from Imperial Plunder, damage that Britain wants to pretend never happened, while simultaneously pretending to be an enlightened, uniquely special country that just did nothing wrong, it's just a birthday boy. Instead, should we not be offering reparations to the countries that Britain devastated? Substantial reparations and more besides. 
debt forgiveness, free movement, education, fucking apologies, helping to rebuild what Britain destroyed, anything but condemning them for this as if homophobia is a uniquely African problem, as if it just appeared there out of nowhere, instead of the British brutally enforcing it until a memory of the time before it was violently suppressed. I mean, the least we could do for this is offer asylum for queer people in the former British Empire, right? Because this is a result of British imperialism. We've got to take fucking responsibility. If our government is serious about becoming a more progressive place, which I don't think it is, should it not put its money where its mouth is? Instead, well, for many LGBTQ plus people, the only hope of escape from this persecution is to seek asylum in other countries. However, the UK's hostile environment policies have made the asylum process a daunting and almost impossible task for many. As an LGBTQ plus asylum seeker, I know how difficult it can be to seek protection in the UK, especially given the culture of disbelief among decision makers. Many LGBTQ plus asylum seekers are rejected because decision makers do not consider them to be persecuted or at risk of persecution in their home country. The Home Office has even demanded proof of sexuality from asylum seekers, making it even more difficult for LGBTQ plus individuals to gain protection. The demand to provide proof is hindered by the Home Office's limited understanding of sexuality and lack of nuance. Sexuality is still largely seen by decision makers and indeed wider society as simply falling into gay or straight. While it is of course traumatic and difficult for gay asylum seekers to apply for protection, a lack of knowledge and stereotypes around bisexuality, pansexuality or fluid sexuality makes it difficult to be believed. Homophobia and transphobia were essential British exports, and pointing at places like Uganda as if they are uniquely homophobic does a disservice to the millions of East Africans who fought the British, who tried and gave their lives to not accept this framework of conservative Christian white supremacy that the British forced upon them. This is a British export, and it's time that the UK recognised that and began to make amends, real material amends for its crimes. And because my own words can't necessarily do the story of queer Africans justice, here are some that I borrowed from Leah Buckle for Stonewall. Prior to European colonisation, throughout the African continent, we see far different, more relaxed attitudes towards sexual orientation and gender identity. In addition to their acceptance of same-sex relationships, ancient Egyptians, similar to other civilizations at the time, not only acknowledge a third gender but venerate it. Many deities were portrayed androgynously, and goddesses such as Mut, the goddess of motherhood, literal translation mother, and Sekhmet, goddess of war, are often depicted as women with erect penises. This was not unique to Egypt or this time period. In the 16th century, the Imbangala people of Angola had men and women's apparel with whom they kept amongst their wives. In contrast, King Henry VIII had just signed the Buggery Act in 1533 in England, which criminalised sex between two males. The last man to be sentenced to death by hanging in England was in 1835 for engaging in homosexual sex, while at the same time there was an openly gay monarch, King Mwanga II of Buganda, present day Uganda, who actively opposed Christianity and colonialism. The Igbo and Yoruba tribes, found mostly in present day Nigeria, did not have a binary of genders and typically did not assign gender to babies at birth and instead waited until later life. Similarly, the Dagaba people, present at Ghana, assign gender not based on one's anatomy, but rather the energy one presents. In the royal palaces of northern Sudan, daughters were sometimes given slave girls for sex. For centuries, across the African continent, there was a completely different attitude towards sexual and gender identities. Many African countries did not see gender as a binary in the way that their European colonizers did. In no African country prior to colonization do we see any persecution of LGBT individuals because of their sexuality, nor any anti-LGBT laws. So how, despite a very relaxed attitude towards homosexuality and gender fluidity for almost all its recorded history, has Africa become one of the most difficult continents to be LGBT? Colonisation and the spread of fundamentalist Christian attitudes from the British meant that much of Africa lost its previous cultural attitude towards sexual orientation and gender identity and were forced to adopt new values from British colonisers in the 19th and 20th centuries. Homophobia was legally enforced by colonial administrators and Christian missionaries. In 1910, Christians made up about 9% of the population of sub-Saharan Africa. By 2010, the figure had leapt to 63%. Anti-LGBT laws were not only written into constitutions, but also into the minds of many African people, and after the passing of several generations, this has become dogma. While many of the countries under British rule are now independent, the majority of those still criminalise homosexuality, including Jamaica and Uganda, have carried over these laws in the colonial era. Generations later, Many Africans now believe that an anti-gay attitude is one that is part of their culture. So much so that former Zimbabwe and President Mugabe labelled homosexuality as a white disease. The association of homosexuality 
as something Western is echoed throughout the ex-Commonwealth, and particularly in African and Caribbean nations. For many who had their lives and culture stripped from them by the British, Westernness is to be treated with suspicion, and it's essential to hold on to any part of themselves and their culture they can. This combined with the fact that Western countries have threatened to deny aid to these countries unless they conform to their ideals has hindered the fight for LGBT rights in African countries. For instance, when ex-Prime Minister David Cameron threatened to withdraw aid from Uganda as they were not adhering to proper human rights, the presidential advisor responded with, but this kind of ex-colonial mentality of saying, you do this or I may withdraw my aid, will definitely make people extremely uncomfortable with being treated like children. After all this, after all this terror, Britain inflicted on the world, the closest we've come to even trying to make amends was a speech from the architect, the very architect of the hostile environment that we were talking about earlier, the architect of the Windrush scandal, Theresa May. We are beyond parody as a country, I swear to God. Anyway, the woman who made it her life's mission to make it impossible to be an immigrant in this country said in a speech to the Commonwealth's heads of government meeting in 2018 that she regretted it. <sighs> Theresa, if you really meant those words, do you think the hostile environment is helping make amends? Do you think deporting the Windrush generation is demonstrative of a changing attitude on this? Because it doesn't look like it from where I'm standing, from the conversation. At the recent Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in London, the British Prime Minister Theresa May urged Commonwealth nations to reform existing anti-gay legislation held over from British colonial rule. And while stopping short of a formal apology, she used her speech to explicitly acknowledge Britain's responsibility. As the United Kingdom's Prime Minister, I deeply regret both the fact that such laws were introduced and the legacy of discrimination, violence and death that persists today. Her speech came in the aftermath of a recent court decision by Trinidad and Tobago to decriminalise homosexuality. On April 12, 2018, Justice Devindra Rampasand of the High Court of Trinidad and Tobago ruled that sections 13 and 16 of the Sexual Offences Act are unconstitutional, illegal, null, void, invalid, and of no effect to the extent that these laws criminalise any acts constituting consensual sexual conduct between adults. The drama came later during an interview with BBC Radio 4's Today programme, when Trinidadian Anglican Bishop Victor Gill called comments made by May a form of neo-colonialism when he denounced the ruling, without noticing the irony that it was British colonial administrators who introduced the anti-gay law in the first place. As much as I want to put a pin in this with Theresa May being the one to make the closest thing to anything on this while doing the most harm she can to the very people who need our help because of this, Considering the sheer amount of harm she's done to the very people hurt by these laws with her actions as Home Secretary and Prime Minister, I am sorry to break it to everyone who would like everything to be tied up with a needle bow here that Theresa May has been succeeded as Prime Minister by a slew of bastards who are making it their duty to crush any gains made by trans people over the last few decades into sludge. With the weirdest part of this being that they make Theresa May look progressive by comparison. Theresa May, who oversaw the Grenfell disaster, who tried to deport the very people who built this country after World War II, who made today's horrific anti-immigration policies possible with her authoritarian exercise of cruelty in the Home Office. Oh God, Britain. It's not changed all that much. For as much as Britain these days likes to think of itself as evolved, as a changed country, as over that period of empire, that it's sorry. The same cruel monsters are still in charge. And I can't say I don't believe that they wouldn't do those same horrific crimes all over again if they had the chance. So, uh, what do you reckon, Dan? Will Britain do the right thing? Dan? Dan? Oh shit. Okay, I think he's gone to tell the king what I've done. Well, I'll try to keep my head on my shoulders, viewers. Someone on this ridiculous island ought to be telling the truth about where all this homophobia in the global south came from, and the sun certainly aren't going to do it. Until then, and until my inevitable re-brainwashing to, to reset my brain to acceptable levels of gullible for a British journalist, good luck out there, fuck the British Empire, queer pride, queer love, queer power, and see you next time. Thanks for watching. Hey everyone, if you like this video and you want to help me eat and sleep and not be sad, why not sign up to my Patreon for £1 a month or more, or donate to me on coffee. It's a one-time thing. 
share the video with your friends, like and subscribe, maybe, possibly. If you sign up to my Patreon, you will get videos multiple days before everybody else. That would be cool. And you'll get your name read out at the end, like these people who I want to personally thank in not a silly song. H, Deanna McMillan, Tweak, Caroline Regalado, Jenny Linsky, Alexandria Lilly, Jay Peterson, Anne Bachera, Howard Lott, Lara Van Loon, Nera Nia, Scar Jan, and Joey Cobalt. I love you. I love you all a lot. You make my life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. From me, from Dan, and from all of us, The Daily Telegraph. And see you on the next one. <laughs>